Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Frank. Uh, I'll be hosting the CCTV basic training. I think let's get going. So what is CCTV? So CCTV is basically closed circuit television. So also known as video surveillance, um, which is used, which is the use of video cameras to transmit a signal to a specific place on a limited set of monitors. This is different from your broadcast television as the signal is, is not openly broadcast. Okay, so unlike your TV, which, which obviously, as we all know, is broadcast to, to the world, CCTV is a closed circuit television and it's specific to your DVR or your NVR. And obviously you can then share that via your apps, et cetera, et cetera. A typical CCTV system consists of one or more cameras which send video images to the main hub, your DVR, that records the data for later viewing and shows it on the monitor for live viewing. Up until recently, all CCTV systems were analog, but with the um, advancement of technology, digital and IP systems have all but completely replaced the analog CCTV systems. Analog CCTV systems use coax cable to transmit the video signal and a separate power cable to power the cameras. Any additional features such as microphone or PTZ functions will require additional wires to the DVR. The wiring in the cable used to set up analog CCTV systems is the same as the HDCVR systems. Okay, so your normal coax um, is, is generally, was generally used for CCTV systems and if you're upgrading from your old analog to HTCVR, then clearly you just use the same, the same wiring. HTCVR stands for High Definition Composite Video Interface. It's rather a bit of a mouthful, but that's what it is. HTCVR provides a different method of transmitting video signals over a coax cable, where analog CCTV video was limited to a low, uh, low video resolution HTCVR uses a video transmit transmitter and receiver that is able to transmit 1080p video resolution. So in other words, 1920 by 1080 or higher over the same standard coax cable that is used for analog CCTV cameras. This video format is able to transmit over longer distances than either analog or network IP cameras and without the latency and bandwidth issues they are so common. Additional, uh, additionally, HDCVR is able to transmit, uh, transmit video, audio, and control OSD or PTZ over a single coax cable instead of requiring separate cables for each transmission. So your new um, HDCVR um, power over coax and audio over coax, so those are all new features which will touch on a little later, but they, they all allow you to transmit audio as well as power over a, a standard coax cable as well nowadays. Okay, so what is coax cable? Coax cable is currently the most commonly used cable for CCTV video transmission. Coax cable is made up of a jack. Let me just go into that. Yeah, so we have on your coax cable, we have our jack. A braid, which is your metal surround. I'm mean, sorry, a jacket, not jack, sorry. Braid, uh, your de electrical, which is your um, like a plastic in the middle of the, the coax cable to obviously uh, stop interference and etc. And then in the center is a copper core. Okay, so generally there are a couple of different coax cables. Um, so the most commonly used one is your RJ, uh, RG59-U is available either in a solid copper or copper clad steel center conductor. It's suitable for basic analog CCTV system feeds, um, uh, uh, basic analog CCTV, basic analog, um, <laughs> Let me try that again. It's suitable for basic analog CCTV antenna feeds in residential applications 
and for basic CCTV systems over short cable runs. So for cable runs under 225 meters. Okay, so this obviously depends very much on the quality of your, your copper that is in the middle of the coax cable. So the purer your copper and the less copper, uh, copper clad steel that you use for the center part, the better your transmission and the longer your transmission um, distances are on that. So that's a maximum of 225 meters. Again, perfect environment and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Next one is your RG6-U, which is a quad shield. And this is used for the distribution of cable TV, so your CATV, and satellite TV, your SATV, in residential commercial premises. It features a copper clad steel in our conductor and can run up to a maximum of about 400 meters. Yeah, RJ11-U is a quad shield as well, um, which is used in the same application as the R, uh, RG6-U for either backbone cabling or for long distance runs. It features a copper clad steel in a conductor and can run up to about, uh, not more than about 500 meters. A BNC connectors are bayonet type connectors commonly used in CCTV systems. They are the, the most commonly used connector for the use with the RG59-U cable. I'm just gonna show you a little picture now on how to um, crimp one of these RG59s. Uh, well, the RJ11 and 59s. Uh, just just note that in in the video, the um, the guy actually doesn't crimp your your pin. Uh, so I would recommend that you crimp the pin. Some guys crimp the pin, some don't. But on your actual your uh, your your coax crimper, there is actually a, a section where you can crimp with the pin itself. So I would always recommend that you crimp the pin, but often guys don't crimp the pin um, because it still makes a, a connection. I personally feel that you, you do need to crimp that pin, but yeah, there seems to be a bit of yes and no around that. So anyway, here's the video and I'll be back after that. To crimp a BNC connector, first place the connectors for rule over the cable. Then cut away the cable's outer sheath and pull back the copper braid. Then cut the inner dielectric insulator so that's approximately one centimeter. And trim the copper plated core to about three millimeters. Place the contact pin over the copper plated core and slide the BNC connector over the contact pin. Now push the ferrule over the BNC connector this will squash the copper braid between the BNC connector and the ferrule. Crimp the BNC connector and trim any copper strands protruding from the connector. Right, so just, just before we continue from, from, from that slide. So it does take a bit of practice to do this, this BNC crimping. So I would suggest if you've never, never done it before, get a couple of pieces of um, cable and practice a little bit before you go on site and try and do this because personally, I struggled when I first started with this and it, it is very fidgety. But um, once you've got the hang of it, it's actually very simple. 
So it just takes a little bit of practice. So persevere and it's definitely, once you've got the knack of it, it's actually very simple and very quick to do that, um, to do the crimping. Okay, yeah, then we go to our famous balance and UTP cable. Um, so what is UTP cable? It stands for unshielded twisted pair. Um, these cables are made up of pairs of wires which are twisted around each other. These are also known as, this is also known as a balanced cable. Okay, so UTP cables require converters, so balance in this case. Uh, to connect the video equipment from the, from uh, to, to connect the video equipment, some cameras may have built-in converters. A good UTP cable to use is a Cat 5E. Each pair of cables can transmit one video signal or channel. Therefore, one UTP uh, Cat 5 or Cat 6 cable um, can support up to four separate video signals. Note, and this is a big note, guys, and ladies, if there's ladies. Uh, <laughs> um, UTP cables should only be used to carry and transmit the video signals and not used to power the CCTV camera, even if it is only 12 volts. So just to stress the, 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 the following is one UTP cable can run four balance, so four cameras, as you should not be running power over that UTP cable. So there was something else I did want to mention about the, the UTP cable. So as, as mentioned before, what happens with a UTP cable is you, you'll see if you actually strip a, a, a Cat5 cable apart, you'll see if you look carefully at the, the different twists on the different uh, pairs, you'll see that are actually twisted differently. So what a lot of guys do and, and it's, it's obviously a, a, a bit of a mistake, but so your, your twists are, are different. So on a hundred meter run, you can have up to like a meter difference between your one twist and your other twist. So what happens is the guys tend to pair the two, the, the like orange, let's take orange, white and blue, white, for example, they, they tend to put them together and pair them, or they put the orange, white on the, on the one pin, the orange and the orange white on the one pin and the blue and the blue white on the other pin of your balin, which causes problems on your balance because your, your video signal then actually lands up not arriving at your destination at exactly the same time. And this sometimes causes like noise on the camera or maybe jumping or, or, or scrolling or things like that on, on your camera. Um, so, yeah, always, always use your, your pairs when you're connecting to your baling. So don't double up on your, your cables. Just use your other orange, white, or orange, or your blue, white, blue, or your green, white, green, or your brown, white, brown, and put those into your, your baling and not, um, you know, double up. So I know a lot of guys try double up and then you have all sorts of funny things happening on and it starts causing, causing a bit of an issue. Um, and again, I can't stress this enough, especially on the higher, um, the higher transmission cameras like your 1080p and up. Please guys, don't run power over the Cat5, uh, the UTP or Cat5 cable or Cat6 cable or, or anything like that. It's not designed for that, and it was never designed in that way. The the, the use of balance was designed so you could get four cameras um, onto one cable, and then power run separately. All right. So what happens when you upgrade from analog to HDCVR? If you already have an analog system, you can easily upgrade it to HDCVR to get higher quality CCTV system without severe cost implications. So with, with that is a lot of your cost goes into doing the cabling. And that's because it's time, it's cable, it's setting up and all those type of things. And when you upgrade from analog to HDCVR, it's a matter of replacing the, the, the DVR. 
Um, almost all HTC VR DVRs will accept both HTC VR cameras and analog cameras. To upgrade an analog system to HTC VR, just replace the, the, the DVR with the HTC VR DVR. You can still use the existing analog cameras and only change the ones that you want to, um, to the HTC VR cameras. Just a little note from, from our side is take note on how the cabling has been done uh, for the analog cameras. Uh, if it is CAT5 and balance are used, if the balance are used, ensure that the power for the cameras is not running on the same CAT5 cable, as this could cause noise on your video, especially if upgrading to 108FP or higher cameras. So like I mentioned before, running power um, with your CAT5 and balance can cause, cause issues. So my recommendation is always to try and use your power axe, um, so your coax with, with power, especially if you're doing things like PTZs, etc. cetera. Um, I've had a lot of issues with PTZs not operating properly over balins. Um, some of them seem to work, some of them don't. Um, so the, the, the PTZ itself, the video all streams fine, but when it comes to controls, they tend to be intermittent. So if you're doing PTZs, especially the higher end PTZs, then I suggest definitely go for coax or even power ax. Just remember, we'll get to that a little later, but just remember to um, the, the, the um, restrictions on how far you can actually run your, your power, um, especially if it's a 12 volt PTZ. The other PTZs, the, the, the 24 and the 48 volt PTZ, do run AC so that actually you can get a little bit more distance but always recommend it to try and get your power supply as close to your cameras as possible. Yeah, great. So wiring tips. I hope nobody's installation looks like that picture. If you ever land up at a customer and their wiring looks like that, you either turn around and you walk away or you charge them another week's labor because to clean up that mess just doesn't look like it's even worth the effort. <laughs> anyway, all right, guys. Um, one trips, uh, trip tips, not trips. Do not, uh, do not damage the cable, obviously the most important thing. Avoid things like excess strain, bending, kinks, or crushing um, before during and after the cable is secured into its final position. Okay. Plan the route so that, that in ceiling space cables do not run over beams in a manner that allows them to be stepped or trampled on. So if you're running cable, yeah, just, just put it out the way if you can so that the people don't stand on it and things like that when somebody else goes into the ceiling because you never know what happens once you actually leave site. For electrical safety and to minimize impulse noise uh, from power cables, maintain adequate clearance plus one meter. Okay, so more than one meter to 
away from things like your water pipes, especially hot water pipes, gas pipes, and of course your uh, electrical cabling and, and that type of stuff. Where cable ties or any type of cable securing devices are used, they should not be excessively tightened. So guys, I know we all try to keep our cabling neat and, and what's the name, but don't over tighten those, those tie straps or the cable ties. Um, if you pull that thing tight and it starts uh, putting pressure on the, on the Cat5 cable, after a while, those strands inside the Cat5 cable can actually break and then you've got to sit and try and figure out where the, the whole issue, issue lands up becoming, um, your, your issue where the cameras aren't working. Okay, any holes or openings should be adequate to allow free movement of cable through them. Conduits should be a minimum of 20 mil diameter using bends and not elbows, where large changes of directions are required. So rather use um, a bend rather than an elbow, because the elbow will obviously is a 90 degree uh, bend and that can cause, and it's a sharp 90 degree bend, and that can cause obviously bending on that cable. And if you've got a, a solid copper core Cat5 cable, bending that cable, obviously that wire needs to bend or those little strands inside that Cat5 cable need to bend and can cause strain and obviously noise and et cetera, et cetera. Especially if there's more than just one cable in a 20 mil conduit. So the, the rule of thumb is is not to bend your cables excessively while handling before fixing in the final position. As a rule of thumb, um, your radius of your bend should be 10 times the diameter of the cable. So if your cable is 10 mil times 10, so your, your, your radius bend should be about 100 mils. That's a big cable, 10 mils, but um, you, you get, it's just easier to calculate it that way. All right, so let's say one mil and your radius is 10 mils. <laughs> Probably makes a little bit more sense than 10 mils, because 10 mils is a big cable. <laughs> okay, most importantly, I, I haven't seen it um, being done these days uh, very much, and I don't think any of you installers actually do that, but it needs to be mentioned because it used to be a very common thing with uh, coax cable. We used to use T pieces and the T pieces, the, the guys used to T um, in the old network. That's, okay, I'm giving my age away here guys, but um, your old networking, you used to use T pieces and you actually used to T your coax cable from point to point and you could go from one coax cable, put a T in and go off to your computer and then go across the same coax cable to the next T piece and go off to the next computer and so forth and so forth. So that's what we call basically stealing the signal. Um, or if you're joining cables, like if you take a Cat5 and for some odd reason, you want to run two cameras on one pair of Cat5, um, then you can have a problem. That means basically teeing of that connector. So it won't work. You're gonna have issues because now the, the DVR only has one channel to put two cameras into, which doesn't obviously make any logical sense. Okay. Okay, so here's a quick video on how to crimp our RJ45. First place the RJ45 boots over the cable. Using the RJ45 crimper or wire cutters, strip the outer sheath of the UTP cable. Untwist the paired wires and order them based on either the T568A or T568B wiring standard. Make sure the wires are all the same length and the outer sheath fits inside the RJ45 connector to be crimped.
slide the wires into the RJ45 connector and crimp it using the RJ45 crimper. Slide the RJ45 boots over the RJ45 connector. Okay, great. So that um, leads us into the networking side of, um, or the, the Ethernet or networking side of um, the CCTV. As I, as I mentioned, um, RJ45 crimping. So that is very much also, I think, a bit of an art to, to get it right and actually do it at any speed. Again, if you've never done it before, grab some cable, grab some RJ45s and a crimper and do a whole lot of crimping and get to know um, how to do it. Practice it. It is very fidgety, um, especially with us people that have got big hands those little wires, the way they twist it, and the way the right way of making up the cable is, um, you know, if it's other class A or class B, like it showed in the diagram earlier, it becomes very difficult and fidgety. And a lot of the times when you push it back into that RJ45, you land up, those, those little wires move, and then you land up are obviously making up the cable wrong and then you have all sorts of issues on your network. So be very careful, practice it, um, and then double check once you've pushed it in before you crimp it, double check to see that those wires are actually, um, those wires are the right way around and the right, right color codes before you crimp it. Because once you've crimped it, that's it. You can never take that what's name off. You've got to cut it down and that, that RJ45 off. Once you've crimped it, that's it. You have to cut it off and throw it away. There's, once it's crimped, it's crimped. You, there's no way of uncrimping it again. So practice. The OJ45s aren't expensive. So if you haven't done it before, like I say, just practice a whole lot of cable until you become comfortable with it. Okay, so what is Ethernet cable? IP systems are wide using Ethernet cables, which consist of unshielded twisted pair, once again. Um, and uh, they obviously use your RJ45 connectors. These have a segmented length of no longer than 100 meters. A segment is a cable run from host to repeater or repeater to repeater. So from your DVR, for example, to your camera, cannot be more than 100 meters. That's standard UTP, um, networking rules so 100 meters is your maximum run if you need to extend your camera so say your camera is further away than 100 meters from your nvr then you've got to do a repeater or a switch as such so you can go from um, your, your your camera to a switch then you go out of your switch to your nvr again from camera to repeater or switch can only be 100 meters and from your switch to the camera again, also 100 meters. So you guys are all sitting there going, yes, but the new DVRs, they can run further distances, um, but you need to, that, that's that DVR or those switches need to be um, the correct switch that you can extend that, that distance. But the rule of thumb for normal networking is maximum 100 meters from host to repeater or from repeater to repeater. Okay, the standard wiring scheme um, and color code. First place the RJ45 boots. Let's start playing again. <laughs> A standard wiring scheme and color coding. Um, so like, like you saw that chart come up um, with, a, with Jared showing you how to crimp that cable. Um, it's called, it's actually referred to as a, either a class A or class B cable. So it's a T568B standard, which we just refer to as, as a class B, or your T568A, which we 
referred to as a class A. So again, normally under your, your standard networking protocols, your floor cabling, in other words, your cabling from, um, you know, from a plug, your, your wall, pl wall jack to uh, wall jack or wall jack to switch is generally a class B. And then your cabling from your wall to your PC or to your NVR or whatever is it usually a class A. But unless you're doing like huge installations and long distances, then it's not really class B is fine to use um, from point A to point B. So from your camera to your switch, from your switch to your next switch, and then back to your NVR. So class B is, is really the most commonly used standard. You can use that or you can use a class A. Some people prefer the A, some people uh, prefer the B. Um, we're not going to get into all the, the, the nitty gritties of that on, on this, but if you want to read up on it and you want to know more information, you've always got Google to go to. All right. Yeah, so code, uh, your, your class A's and class B's. I can't stress this enough. Please, if, you, if you're out there and you're doing cabling for CCTV, make sure that you stick to class A or class B cabling, whichever one is your preference. Do not make straight through cables. So when I straight, say straight through cables, um, I mean, so orange, white, orange, blue, white, blue, green, white, green, brown, white, brown. So just straight without the twists and without the, the splitting of the pins and all that type of stuff. It causes issues, you lose distance. The reason they, they've got those twists and the reason they, they make the cable up like that is so that you can get your 100 meters. So I often have guys say, yes, but I'm only doing 10 or 20 meters, et cetera, et cetera. It might work now, but tomorrow I guarantee you it's not going to work. So stick to your correct um, class A or class B cabling and you shouldn't have issues down the line. Um, I've seen that do the weirdest things, especially on PoE, where it switches the camera on and then it switches the camera off, then it switches the camera on and it switches the camera off. Or if it's not, not necessarily, even if you put power onto that camera, then the camera is online, then it's offline, then it's online, then it's offline. So that, that doing, doing that with straight through camera, not using class A or class B cabling, can cause issues and will cause issues in the future for you. Okay, so if you take, take um, it's also important to take note of the, the green white and green pair across the, uh, the three and the six uh, pin. So what I mean by that is take note that you, you the green and green white is actually split where with the blue and blue white in the middle of it. Okay, so it's important to do it that way. Like I say, distance, um, reliability, et cetera, et cetera, over the cable is very important to make up those cables in the correct way. Not only does it help um, identifying the crimping errors, but more importantly, the twist is used to cancel out signal crosstalk between pairs. So signal crosstalk is when you land up with noise over your cable and noise is always a bad thing so um, if you do get signal crosstalk, the signal coming from the one side does not match up with the signal on the other side, and then you get your camera switching on and off and saying online, offline, et cetera, et cetera. So like I say, guys, try and practice doing that, that, that cat fiber. It is fidgety. I still struggle with it after all these years. I still struggle to, well, I don't say struggle, but it's, it's not, Convenient, put it that way. Um, yeah, I've got big fat fingers, so it doesn't really help me um, trying to fit it with these little cables. So again, practice, as, as everybody says, practice makes perfect. Okay, guys. Hope everybody's got their cup of coffee. Definitely needed one of those. And I had to run up three flights of stairs to go and get because there's no coffee downstairs in our training room. Uh, fun and games. 
anyway, so uh, if I'm sounding out of breath, uh, you know why that is now. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm just going to play this next video. So this is our um, introduction to RP. So obviously the, the cabling is the one side of things and now RP training is sort of uh, another side of things. So this is really basic um, IP training. There's obviously a lot more. Um, we don't all want to be MCSEs and heavy qualified, um, uh, how can I say, IT experts to have to be able to install the IP CCTV side of things. So we've just kept it basic. Hopefully you guys can get an understanding of what, what is um, trying to become, uh, what we're trying to get across to you. Uh, what I will be doing at the end of the session, um, and it's entirely up to you whether you want to stay on or not, but once I'm finished with training, I'm going to go, I've got a live NVR with me here, and I'll just go through the settings and the setup of the RP, add some RP cameras, and just go through a couple of the things that, um, you know, I'll, I'll try obviously do this as live as possible. And we'll go through a couple of the, the things and how to set it up and just notes. But this should give you a good background as far as what, we, what we're talking about with IP addresses and what, we, what we're trying to, to get across as far as the importance of, of the IP address on, on a network, basically. All right, cool. So let me start this video for you guys. What is a LAN? A local area network, or LAN, is a computer network that connects IP devices together in a limited area, such as a home or office building. What is an IP address? An IP address is an address given to each IP device on a network that allows you to identify it. An IP address is made up of four numbers, like a house address is split into a road and a house number. An IP address is split into a network and a host number. IP devices can only talk to other IP devices with the same network address. What is a subnet mask? A subnet mask determines which of the four numbers in an IP address are used for the network and which are used for the host. Think of 255 as the network marker and 0 as the host marker. What is a default gateway? To connect to any device outside of your network, you must go through your default gateway. The default gateway is generally the IP address of your router, and this will usually be the network address with a host address of 1.
Okay. What is Oops, it? Sorry, I will click on that one. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so, like, like mentioned in that video, there's, there's three aspects of your um, IP setup. There's your IP address, your subnet mask, and your gateway. So your gateway, again, is important if you're wanting your device to have internet access. So if you're wanting to, um, so if you're wanting to, for example, connect via your remotely to the your device via either your cell phone or via another network, then that's NVR or DVR needs to be able to have a gateway which will tell it this is where you will get your internet from. Okay. So what is IP? IP is uh, IP stands for Internet Protocol, a method by which data is sent from one IP device to another over a standard IP network. Each device on the network must have a unique IP address before it can communicate with other devices on the network. If a device has the same IP address as another, it will cause an IP conflict. So IP conflicts are a big problem on the network. It's almost like having somebody move into your house that you actually don't want to have in your house. And that obviously then causes a conflict. <laughs> right. So the same as your IP, it's basically an IP address squatting on another person's IP address. So it causes issues and it can cause your device, which I'll actually demonstrate um, later on, to not be your, your, your NVR, for example, not to see your cameras if all the cameras are all and your DVR are all on the same IP address that causes a conflict, an IP conflict. Just a note on that is that the Dahua stuff does all come out with the same IP address. So the default IP address is your 192.168.1.108. So your NVRs, your cameras and everything do come out with the same IP address. So it's generally not a good idea to just plug everything into your network and expect everything to start working. Um, so when, when I'm referring to that, we're obviously not referring to the PoE ports at the back of the NVRs. So if you're using a NVR with no PoE ports, or you're using a combination of the PoE ports at the back of an NVR with your LAN port, then it's, it's a different story. But we'll get into that a little later when I, when I show you the live demonstration, I'll explain all that, what the difference is. Um, and yeah, take it from there. Okay, uh, a IPv4 address uses four numbers to address a computer. The numbers are always between zero and 255 and are separa separated by a full stop. For example, 192.168.1.108. It is a preferred method to have your DVR or NVR on a fixed or static IP address, which is normally assigned by the network administrator. So any, any questions on, on, on that, guys? Um, if, if you're not sure or something, just pop me a chat there, as this is probably the most important thing as far as setting up your, your NVRs and your, your, your IP cameras. So I know there's a lot of guys out there that traditionally will want to move from your XVRs or your analog cameras through to IP because IP is obviously becoming the, the new norm, if you want to put it that way. But XVRs and HTCVRs are obviously knocking on the IP, IP's um, heels. But IP can cause other issues and can cause, cause headaches if you don't understand the basic concept of what a LAN should look like and what an IP address is about and the fact that you have IP conflicts and all those type of things. Okay, cool. From your browser, go to the IP address of the camera and log in.
select the setup tab and select network. Click on the TCP IP subheading and change the IP address, subnet mask and default gateway, then select save. So changing IP addresses, um, changing IP address, when installing a CCTV IP device, for example, all the devices come out with the default IP address of 192.168.1.108, which I've already mentioned. Due to this, you must change the IP addresses so they're all on the same network. <clears throat> so they must obviously be on the same network. This can be done using the DVR, the manufacturer's config tool, or the CCTV device web interface. So multiple ways of doing it. You can either use what they call the config tool for Davo, um, your web interface, like Kyle has shown you on the, on the demonstration, or on the DVR itself. You need to ensure that all devices are in the same IP range, but have their own unique IP addresses, as explained in the previous screen. Having two devices on the same IP address will cause an IP conflict once again, and could cause the cameras not to show on the network at all, or the DVR not being able to display any cameras on the camera search. Okay, it's also recommended to plug in one device at a time, configure its IP address, then plug in the next device or camera. So don't just install everything and then just bomb everything into your switch and hope for the best. Um, plug them in one at a time, configure the camera, do what you need to do, and then plug in your next camera. It's just gonna make your life a lot easier. Uh, some NVRs have onboard POEs. Uh, with these units, there should be no need to configure the IP addresses of the cameras, just plug them in. Uh, just plug them in. As the cameras will get the IP address from the onboard DHCP server. Okay, so your your NVRs have your some of the NVRs. Let's put it that way. Have onboard POEs, and the IP range of those onboard POEs is obviously different to your LAN port. So your LAN port and your POEs actually work independently, um, and they are then bound inside the NVR to be able to display them all on one NVR. Okay. If you are remotely connecting via your LAN port, so via the internet to your LAN port, um, you cannot talk let's say you cannot talk or, or connect to your cameras directly. You've got to go via the NVR and then the NVR will link you back to those cameras. So you can't, for example, um, put in the IP address of the camera. If you're remote, if you're remotely connected, put in the IP address of the camera and expect to connect to the camera. It's just not going to happen. Okay. But I'll show you that once, once we do the live demo and we can go through that if, if you guys are not sure what I'm talking about. Okay, cameras. So, so there's different types of cameras. Uh, we'll start off with a box camera. So this over here is your typical box camera. Uh, box cameras are versatile as they can be mounted inside a building by using a simple bracket or outside by adding a weatherproof housing. Box cameras require a lens to be attached to them uh, which generally have to be bought separately. But this allows you to choose the best lens for your needs. So the box cameras can come out with some really nice lenses. So you can really look, um, you know, quite quite far with these, these box cameras. But uh, I find, yeah, the box cameras don't get used as, as much anymore, uh, simply because the technology in your other cameras nowadays has sort of moved on and you do get some decent, um, uh, how can I say, yeah, decent zooms and that type of stuff off your, your normal uh, other, other cameras. Um, this lens may, may be a long focal, lens, uh, focal length lens, which the subject
Okay, sorry. This lens may be a long focal length lens where the subject is at a distance or at a wide angle lens. If the subject is closer or if you need an overview picture. So obviously your lens can be adjusted to either zoom into, into a, a subject or zoom out of a subject. So you'll either get a wide angle or you get a, a narrower angle, angle but zoom further in. A very focal lens can, can also be used, which allows you to manually adjust the zoom level and the focus level. If it's a manual adjustment, you've got to do the zoom and the focus um, to get closer to your, to obviously get closer to view your objects. Box per cameras are becoming less and less popular, like I mentioned, due to the cost and the variety now found in the bullets and the dome cameras. Okay, so jump the gun there a little bit, but yeah. I'm sure you guys get the drift. Okay, the other thing with, with uh, box cameras, in, you, you'll notice that the box cameras don't have IRs. So some of the box cameras, um, you can get a housing with the IRs on it, but just be careful that that box camera is actually compatible with, with the IR and can accept IR light um, and switch obviously to black and white. So the traditional, box cameras that I know generally don't have and can't see at night. So they, they don't have the facility to actually um, utilize the IR light and be able to see at night. So there's a bit of a downfall in some of them, but there are newer ones that obviously you can, they come in the housings with the IRs built into the housings and then the, the camera's obviously compatible and you can get, like I say, get some really nice zooms on those, those cameras. Uh, bullet cameras, this is your traditional bullet camera. Obviously, you get the smaller ones and then you get the bigger ones. Um, just all depending on what, what the, the functionalities of that, that bullet camera, camera is. Uh, bullet cameras are discreet, affordable, and usually come with a built-in weatherproof, uh, uh, built-in weatherproofing. So there is no need to buy a separate external housing to protect them. This cuts down on installation time and expense. The bullet cameras, because of its size, is also less um, abrasive and reg regular cameras allowing you to semi-convertently maintain surveillances without the need of hidden cameras. Sure. Okay, that, that was a bit of a mouthful. So basically what they're saying is the cameras are quite small and you can sometimes hide them away and not really in your face as such. Unlike your, your box cameras, which has got a housing now and is like really there and known. It sometimes is a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, but anyway, that's um, entirely up to you and what, what the customer's requirements are. So dome cameras, which is this type of camera here. Again, also different sizes, um, different functions. Um, for example, this, this one here is what they call a vandal proof dome. So if you smack this thing with a hammer, apparently it doesn't break. I've never had the opportunity to, to actually test it, but apparently they're supposed to be vandal proof. Um, nobody's given me a camera to actually test it, so I don't know why, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, uh, dome cameras are popular because they can be installed discreetly on a wall or a ceiling with all the cables hidden within the casing and the ceiling. Uh, unlike box cameras, dome cameras come with a built-in lens, um, usually one um, of two types. So basically what I was saying is the dome cameras come out with two different types of dome cameras. You've got a fixed lens and you've got a focal lens. A fixed focal length um, lens where the view cannot be changed or an adjustable a very focal lens where a small adjustment to the view angle can be made to get the required view. So zoom in, zoom out. You now even get the um, motorized um, zoom cameras where you can actually zoom in and out without the manual intervention of 
zooming and adjusting your readjusting your focus with the little slide bars that you get on the cameras, um, which can be quite tricky sometimes because you've got to get the focus in and you've got to get the zoom and with your motorized lenses now, you can actually do that all from your NVR or your DVR and you can zoom in and it will actually autofocuses for you. Or you can manually focus it if you want, which is quite cool and saves you loads of time. Although again, it's, it's an extra feature. So what lands, it lands up being a little bit more expensive than your normal manual lens. But I think for the cost differences, often your labor is, is more expensive than the cost difference between a motorized lens and a manual uh, very focal lens. Okay, the very focal lenses um, are not normally more than about 12 millimeter. So domes are generally not used um, when you need to zoom, zoom in close to an object to see small details. Like a person's face at the entrance point or to view a vehicle license number plate. So the the domes have come off uh, far away, but there's still limitations on the domes. So just keep it in mind, make sure that you obviously are going to see what you, you want to see if you're going to be installing a dome. Okay, speed domes. So this is your generally what a speed dome looks like. So your speed domes is also known as a PTZ. So in some cases you, you want to be able to zoom in far, be able to look at different positions. Uh, this is where your PTZ comes in. So PTZ stands for your pan, tilt, and zoom. So as, it, as in the description of PTZ, your pan allows you to pan across left and right. It allows you to tilt up and down. And it obviously allows you to zoom in. And generally, most PTZs these days or autofocus. So as you zoom in, it focuses automatically. So there's new technology now, which um, as, you, as you're zooming in, the camera is already um, autofocusing on your picture. Whereas the old PTZs, what used to happen is you need to zoom in, then the camera, once you finish zooming in, the camera then decides, okay, now it needs to focus. So it takes a second or two to focus and, there's, um, and then obviously focuses into the position where you've stopped. Whereas the new PTZs, as you're zooming in, it's already focusing and it's keeping everything in into that focused um, area so that everything looks clear all the time, not only once you've finished zooming in. Which is cool technology and obviously with as things move on, these, these type of things will improve. Um, so these cameras can also be controlled remotely. So you can either control them with, with a joystick um, a keyboard or joystick if you want to pull it that way or you can you can control them via your DVR or NVR. So you do get HTC VR PTZs as well as your normal RP, RP PTZs. So both ways your HTC v, uh, CVR can be controlled by the, the DVR. The, as far as I know you can use the joystick but the joystick actually connects to the DVR and then controls your PTZ from there. Um, which is not a greatest, I, I feel it's a little slow, um, but your RPPTZ, you can put a joystick directly onto, onto your network and you can control your RPPTZ directly from your joystick as well as controlling it from your NVR. Um, HTC VR, your controls can sit on, you can even have controls on your remote desktop. So you can, using smart PSS or, your cell phone app, your GDM SSS, you can use that to control your PTZs as well, which is, is quite cool. Okay, so that's pretty much as far as the different types of cameras go. Okay, so what is resolution? Resolution obviously is, is a big thing. You have your different resolutions where we all traditionally come from is your analog which these days, if you compare analog to, to the quality of cameras that we get these days is just completely chalk and cheese. Um, you know, your good old days of having this view of just a pixelized face is pretty much gone. Not totally gone, obviously, because it's, it really depends on the amount of pixels, 
which we'll go into shortly. Okay, one of the most important aspects of a camera is the res resolution that it can offer. A camera's resolution is determined, sorry, the camera resolution determines the amount of detail that can be seen in the image. The advantage of using an IP camera over an analog camera has always been the ability to prov provide a much higher resolution than the typical analog cameras. Although the gap is now being closed by the HD analog solutions. Resolution is measured in pixels and often abbreviated to megapixels or MP. Yeah. One megapixel is equivalent to one million pixels. The higher resolution uh, is often preferred, but there are drawbacks. As the higher, resolu the higher resolution video stream will require, re <laughs> my goodness, I've got a mouthful of teeth right now. Okay, as the higher resolution video stream will require greater storage and bandwidth, and typically low light performance uh, will begin to suffer. Okay, so the, the higher resolution, the more bandwidth you're going to be using, the more hard drive space you're going to be using to be able to save that footage. Um, and the lower your lights, obviously, um, the, the more it's going to actually suffer in, in the performance of that, that camera. Although these days there's a lot built into these cameras, like your um, highlight, uh, your low light compensation, your highlight compensation, your, your um, IRs, now we've got the new um, color night cameras. So, but all, all this is, is technology built into these cameras nowadays to make the video look better. Okay, but the baseline of all of this is really your megapixels and what they can display and the higher the megapixels, the, the, the better the picture quality. Okay, it also boils down to the fact that you know, with 4K coming out and that type of stuff, it doesn't help having a 4K machine or a 4K camera um, and then having a HD TV. So if you're going to have a, H, a 4K DVR and 4K cameras, make sure that you've got the 4K TV to support the, the back end and obviously be able to display that 4K resolution. So your, your different resolutions, um, your, your Dimension widths of your resolution, as you can see on your screen, it, it really is the, the, the difference between um, the size of the picture that you, as, as normal, without zooming in or anything, that is the size of your picture that you would actually be displayed if it was just displayed on the screen, for example. So your one megapixel um, has got a width of 1280 by a height of 720. Your 1.3 megapixel, which is not very common, is 128 over 1024. The two megapixel, which is probably the most common camera nowadays, is a 1920 by 1080. And then you go to your four megapixel, which jumps to 2688 to 1520. So you can already see your, your, your height and your width of your cameras, as you can see in the demonstration on your, on your screen, as you go up, the quality is the same, but the picture is big, bigger. So your pixels are obviously a heck of a lot more. So you can actually display a bigger picture at the same quality as, um, you know, your, your entry level camera, your one megapixel, and your four megapixel. So the more definition you can get, so the bigger the picture you can get, the more pixels, the clearer your, your picture is at the end of the day. So you go up to right up to an eight megapixel, which can, uh, which is a width of 3840 to a height of 2160. So now you're starting to play in the 4K arena. So yeah, again, make sure your screen itself can actually handle the 4K and be able to display it. Like I say, it's pointless having a, a, a DVR that can display 4K with an eight megapixel camera and you've got a normal HD screen. All right. Okay, hey, just a couple of basic uh, camera features. So most cameras these days do have these features already built in. Um, obviously things like your 
POE and RVS is specifically around the IP cameras and not necessarily HTCVR. But HTCVR does have some of these um, features built in. Okay, so infrared is obviously for RP and HTCVR. Um, infrared security cameras have the capability to capture video in low light and even total dark, uh, dark environments. Infrared cameras or IR cameras have IR LEDs positioned around the outer edge of the camera lens, which gives the camera its ability to see in zero light. Okay, the video image is converted to a black and white to give the ability to pick up the IR light. Okay, I'm sure you guys have all seen that. Um, when it becomes dark, then IR light switch on and your camera switches to black and white. Okay, what is the RP rating? So your RP rating is your, uh, RP actually stands for ingress protection. So your RP rating, when we talk about RP rating, we're talking about weatherproof rating, not your, your internet protocol. I know it's very confusing. All those acronyms are just, especially if they're the same. You, the minute I look at RP, I think of internet protocol, but in this case, it's actually the RP rating. The easy way to see it is it's usually followed by a couple of numbers. So it's usually RP 67 or something to that effect. It's not just RP on its own. So, sorry, that screen to me that you're looking at actually looks a bit deceiving. <laughs> anyway, let's carry on. Um, RP uh, ingress protection in this case, ratings are used to define the level of sealing effectiveness of electrical enclosure, enclosures against intrusion of foreign bodies such as dirt and moisture. The RP rating consists of two digits, the first indicating the protection against objects or dirt, and the second indicating the protection against moisture. Okay, so first one, uh, dust and dirt, second one, obviously moisture and rain or whatever the case is. When, de when dealing with waterproof cameras, you are looking for an IP rating of at least IP65, IP66, or IP67. The leading six means the camera is protected against harmful dust, and the second number indicates the following. So if you've got an IP65, so the uh, six means that it's protected against dust, um, the five uh, protects against water spray from all directions. Okay, so the, the five indicates that it's protected against water spray from all directions. The RP66, so the second six, protects against low pressure, uh, low pressure water jets from all directions. And the RP67 protects against strong water jets and waves. Okay, I'm not sure who takes the camera to go and surf in the waves, but anyway, if you guys are using that, so if you're going for a board meeting in the sea, make sure that you take your RP67 camera with you. Well, at least RP67 because it's going to be protected against waves. Cool. Sorry, I'm just talking nonsense here. <laughs> okay, very focal. So, what is a very focal? A very focal lens is an adjust. Uh, a lens is adjustable and can be zoomed and refocused. They are generally used where the focal point required image is more specific or is required to see a longer distance, keeping in mind that as the lens is zoomed, so the field of view is made smaller and narrower. So, so again, there, as, as you're zooming into, so if you, if you zoomed out completely to, to, with the camera, your field of view is, is wide, and as you zoom in, it sort of narrows in, sort of getting a tunnel vision, if you want to call it that way. So from seeing wide, you get the tunnel vision. As you zoom in, you get a tunnel vision looking at a specific point. So nowadays, as I mentioned before, you have what you call a motorized verifocal lens. Unlike the, the, the traditional manual adjustable uh, adjustable zoom and focus, which allows one to zoom in and out uh, from your compatible 
DVR or NVR. This is system making installation less labor intensive. So like I said, on the, on the motorized lens, you can actually zoom in and out of that, uh, that, that with that camera via your NVR or your DVR, which is obviously a big plus if you're busy setting it up, you point your, your camera in your, your general direction and instead of staying up on the ladder and having a little screen or somebody at the DVR shouting at each other saying, ah, oh, zoom in, zoom out, no focus a little to the left, no focus to the right, no zoom out, zoom in. Um, pretty much you go to your DVR, point the camera in the general direction and you go to your DVR and you zoom in and it should auto actually auto focus most of the time, but there usually is a button to, to readjust your, your focus manually if you really need to, which makes life an installation. Instead of having to have two people on site now, you can pretty much do it yourself by just going there. You might need to go up once you zoom in, you might need to go up and just adjust your camera up and down slightly, um, but that's a minor, minor adjustment at the end of the day. Okay. WDR, so what does WDR stand for? WDR stands for the Wide Dynamic Range. This is a feature that helps to balance over uh, exposed video images that has a large difference between the lightness and the darkness parts of the image. This is especially important in areas that have a lot of natural light, like entrances or large windows leading outside. So the WDR is quite a cool feature in the, in the cameras. So for example, let's say you have a room, um, let's, let's say a boardroom where you've got natural light coming in, your camera's sort of facing towards the boardroom, but the natural light is affecting, is very bright and your boardroom table is then sort of darkish or the other side of the boardroom is also dark. The WDR basically, WDR basically, brings down the bright light from the window and brings up the contrast of the darker, darker areas, balancing the video and making it look like the video is actually not out of balance as far as bright light from the window and the dark, dark or shadowy light from, from the other side of the boardroom table. As a, it basically balances them up and makes them look like it's actually the same, the same light, if you want to put it that way. So it highlights the one and dims down the other side. Okay. Okay, POE. The POE is obviously the buzzword and makes life a lot easier for, for us and, and installations. So POE stands for power over ethernet. This is a technology that transmits both data and power simultaneously to the network device using standard CAT5 cable. POE allows you to supply power to an IP camera using the same cable that transmits the data. This is greatly reduces the cost of installation and maintenance. So you don't have to go now and store power supplies all over the place. All you do is you connect your camera to POE and boom, it's got power. So just keep in mind guys, maximum 100 meters. So if you are Further away, the camera is further away and you need POE, then go from your DVR, you go to a normal switch. From the normal switch, you can go to the POE switch and then you use the POE ports on that, the second switch to actually power your cameras with. Okay, but, um, so RVS, RVS is also a buzz um, with the new cameras these days. You've got smart RVS or what they call um, intrusion protection. Uh, so that is basically the identification of um, a, or the identification between a human and a vehicle, but using the RVS protocol. So using RVS, uh, RVS basically covers. All right, let, let's start off with what RVS actually means. So RVS is intelligent video system. Is the te technology available? in the newest IP cameras. RVS features include the tripwire, intrusion, abandoned objects, missing objects, and scene changes. So the way this RVS really works is, um, so for example, let's say you've got a tripwire setup. Let's start off with a tripwire. 
So what you do is you, you use your tripwire, draw a line over the screen, and only once somebody actually moves over that line will it trip. So you don't use things like motion detect, whereas motion detect generally will look at a scene and if there's any form of motion, whether it's a leaf or whether it's a shadow or whether it's whatever, it will then trigger that, that movement and obviously record it or set off your alarms or whatever you've got, got that set up. So Tripwire defines that, that a little bit more. So Tripwire allows you to define an area. So only once a person um, or something moves over that, that Tripwire or crosses that Tripwire, so a vehicle crosses a Tripwire, you can have it strung across the street. So as soon as the vehicle crosses a Tripwire, it will start recording or sending off your alarm or doing whatever the case is. So intrusion is a little bit different. So intrusion is um, you would draw a block on your, your screen and once something moves into that block, so um, moves in or out of that block, then that will then set off your intrusion area. Okay, um, your abandoned objects is also you'll draw a block on your screen and if an object is there for longer than a certain period of time within that area, it will then say, set off an alarm and say there's an abandoned object. This so uh, nice to use in, for example, things like airports where a, uh, maybe a suitcase or something has been left there for more than five minutes. Um, it will then set off an alarm um, in the control room and say, hey, there's an abandoned object, call the dogs, call the cats, call the, the alarm response, call everything because we think it might be a bomb or something like that. So that's what an abandoned object is. Missing object is exactly the opposite. So it will detect your, you obviously draw a block again. Um, if there is a, for example, let's say a laptop on a, on a table or whatever, and it's looking at that laptop, suddenly that laptop disappears. Um, magically, no hands, no nothing, it just magically disappears. That'll then become a missing object and it'll obviously set up the, set off the alarm, et cetera. So, and the last thing is your scene chain. So to look at a specific scene, obviously it needs to be a static scene and not um, a movable scene. So you can't have trees and all that type of stuff. It'll be more for internal. As soon as that scene changes, then As soon as that scene changes, then you will get um, obviously the alarm or the alerts coming through. So again, I think all the cameras we sell now, um, IP cameras, let's go just, just do IP. This is generally available only on IP cameras. HTC VR cameras can't do this. Um, it is available on, on the XVRs themselves and obviously on NVR. So what we, we talk about, what we, um, what we normal, normally say is front end and back end. So when we talk about the RVS being available on, RVA, um, on the camera, that means on the front end. When we talk about RVS being available on the DVR or the XVR, we talk, that, talk about that as being back end. So when you talk about back end, there are limitations as to how many back-end RVS rules you can actually use on your DVR or, or um, XVR or NVR. Okay, so uh, Zorita, good question. Um, generally on a standard RVS, no, you can't, it uh, can't determine between um, people and objects, um, but with your, um, your new you, I, I, intelligence uh, DVRs and cameras, like I said, what they have is they have the intrusion, intrusion detection um, or perimeter protection as they actually call it to be more, more accurate. So your per perimeter protection basically can distinguish between what a human and a vehicle is. So if a cat, for example, goes over your RVS line, it shouldn't detect it. Um, but if a person or a vehicle goes over it, then it will set off that, that um, uh, RVS trigger or whatever the case is. So yes, it's, it's getting there. Whether it's 110% at this stage, um, I doubt. But the nice thing about the, the new intelligent um, cameras and that type of stuff, 
they have what they call a learning algorithm in them and that can allow, allow the DVRs and the cameras to actually learn and to understand a little bit more. So as the technology moves on, um, you know, they will understand more as to the difference between a human figure and, for example, a cat or a dog. So generally cats and, cats and small cats and small dogs are usually not an issue. Um, it just becomes a problem if a dog, for example, jumps up on you and that, that size image becomes, um, yeah, becomes the same as a human figure would, would look like. So large dogs and humans can look the same. Also wild animals, um, we, we often get the, the question, you know, on game farms and that type of stuff. That becomes an issue sometimes because you could have a lion that's almost the same size as a human crawling or even bigger, if you want to put it that way. So yes, it's getting there as far as um, getting more, um, more accurate, but at this stage, it's really, your perimeter protection is a lot more intelligent than your standard RVS. So standard RVS will still trigger if, um, let's say, let's take my camera at home. So I have RVS set across my, my road, but I still do get triggers when the sun is shining from the one direction and the shadows actually move over that IVS line. So I do sometimes get triggers like that, but it's a lot less than your normal motion detect. So again, you can, you can actually set your IVS parameters to become a little bit more, um, let's say, um, what am I trying to say? A little bit more accurate in a way that you, you can actually, so with RVS, you can actually set the size of your object that you want to only detect. So you have a minimum size and a maximum size. So if you set your minimum size bigger than the cat that would walk over your trip wire, then it won't obviously um, detect the cat every time it walks, over the, uh, walks past the trip wire. But if you have a larger dog, then it will obviously set it off or if you have a human that crosses it, then you'll obviously set it off because your minimum and your maximum sizes are, can be set with RVS. So that, that is a nice feature as far as RVS is concerned, is that you can actually have that minimum and maximum size. But also important for your perimeter protection that also, also provides you the feature of having your minimum and maximum size. So hope that answers your question. A bit long-winded, but I think you probably get the gist of it. So yes, the, the advanced RVS or the perimeter protection RVS can dis or should be able to distinguish between a person and a vehicle or a person and you're moving trees and that type of stuff um, or a little cat or something like that. So, all right, we go back to uh, our HTCVI and our balance. So balance are used uh, when you want to run a UTP cable in place of a standard coax cable. Depending on the manufacturer, you can connect your UTP cable directly to the balance, um, or you may have to crimp an RJ45 connector. So again, this, 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 these specific ones that we're showing here, you'll see that's actually RJ45 connectors in. The ones we showed earlier, um, where Jared was uh, demonstrating the, the connecting of the balance, that was just straight Balin connected to the Cat5 cable with this specific ones um, because they actually run power over these Balins as well to give you the longer distance. Um, they actually need your RJ45s to be crimped on and your cable to be made up again as class A or class B. Right, so different types of Balins, but pretty much you get your, your same result maybe over longer distances on, on the balance. Okay, so there are two types of, uh, there are two main types of balance. You've got your passive balance, which do not require power and can support cable lengths up to about 400 meters. Check your distance on your specification sheet. As with most balance, the higher the, the resolution of the camera, the less distance you can run with the cable. So important note there, go, Check that spec sheet on your on your um, on your balance. You will see as you go up in your resolution the distances that you can use that balance with 
actually start coming down. So if you're using a 720p camera, then you'll probably get your 400 meters. If you're using a 1080 camera, it can drop down to about 250 meters. And if you're using a four megapixel camera, it can drop right down to like 150 meters odd. Okay, but check that spec sheet. Normally those balance come with a little card at the back of them and they can, and from there you'll be able to see, um, from there you'll be able to see that, uh, what distances you can run according to the resolution of the camera you're installing. Okay, active balance, which are not very common anymore, but anyway, they are around, um, which do require uh, power, uh, possibly either 12 volts, 24 volts, 48 volts, and some of them even 220 volts AC. Okay, so um, they can support cable lengths up to a thousand meters, depending on the, Balin, the, the type of Balin um, connectors that you actually get. So these ones over, uh, these ones over, whoopsie, over here, um, are, are the basically, probably the 220 volt powered ones, which you can probably get like uh, a thousand meters odd on. So they actually come in like a box format as, as shown there. Again, something that's not very commonly used these days, but yeah, they, I don't think RDS sells them anymore, uh, but yeah, I'm sure you'll be able to get them elsewhere if you just shop around. So a big note here, don't mix active and passive balance. You could blow the balance all together um, also take note that HTCVR cameras do require HTCVR balance. Guys, don't get the old analog. I think most of the balance these days, especially the ones that RDS sell, are HTCVR balance. But if you come across and you're doing an upgrade um, and the guys are using balance and you're putting HTCVR cameras, make sure that the balance aren't analog. Um, rather, if you're going to quote and you're not sure, then rather quite on balance and a camera because um, you, you will run into issues if you try to put HTCVR, especially 1080p and up. 720p's, don't really worry about it. 1080p's, start having issues and four megapixel, well, yeah, just won't work. Okay, so what is a ground loop isolator? Um, as you can see, that video is not my internet that's breaking up like that. That is the actual video of what you can, the type of noise that you can get over your cameras. And you can see the flashing and the, the, the sort of lines that are going up and down the screen. I hope you guys can see that. So that is just a, to show you guys what, what interference you can get on your cameras and that a ground loop isolator can actually resolve that. A ground loop up isolator, uh, a ground loop is caused when an unwanted electrical current flows down the CCTV cable, resulting in a difference in ground between the DVR and the camera. A ground loop isolator should be installed in line with the video cable at the camera side. You will need to install a ground loop isolator for each camera that seems to be affected by the ground loop. So if you're getting something like that, or you're getting your scrolling screen, or you're getting like a lines that are running from the top to the bottom or vice versa, or you're getting like flashes like it's showing in the video, um, or you're getting waves. Those could all to be, all, that all could be to do with the ground, ground loop. Um, it could also be to do with, um, if you are running power over your Cat5 cable. Okay, so, Either, either you try and install a ground loop isolator, if you are and you can't get power in any other way, and try and installing a ground loop isolator it should um, smooth out the, 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 the video. Otherwise, just try to bring your power supply closer and actually run it on a separate cable. Okay, surge protection. Um, electrical surge protection can damage CCTV equipment uh, and, and needs to be protected. The most common cause is lightning. However, um, can also be caused by high voltage power surges, high, high voltage power cables um, running next to your CCTV cable. 
Well, there's nothing we can really do to protect our equipment against direct lightning strikes. A surge protector can protect you from nearby, uh, a nearby strike or power surge that would usually damage your CCTV system. So if you have a direct power uh, lightning strike, the chances are even with lighting protection, it's going to fry your equipment anyway. But generally, yeah, if it's nearby or the, the surge protection these days are very good and should actually protect your equipment if need be. Uh, surge protection only works in one direction. So it will only protect the device if it, um, that it is attached to. If you want to protect both your camera and your DVR, you will need to use two surge protectors, one on either side of the cable. Okay, so if you want to, if you wanted to protect your DVR, your surge protector is obviously on the DVR side. If you wanted to protect your camera, then your surge protector is on the camera side. If you wanted to protect both, you need two surge protectors. Okay, power supplies. Although CCTV cameras do not uh, use large amounts of power, consideration does need to take, uh, be taken on the type of cable used, as small changes in your power will affect the video image. Most CCTV cameras use a 12 volt DC and even sm a small lower voltage example, a drop of one volt to 11 volt DC is a drop of more than 8% and, and can cause negative effects in the video image quality. It is best to, be, uh, is best to use a cable of at least 0.5 millimeter or thicker um, and needs to be a copper core. Like your 0.5 flex rip cord, um, like your, your 0 0.5 uh, ripcord. Do not use UTP cable to send power to the cameras. Please guys, firstly, it's not um, thick enough, so it doesn't, it's not as thick as the 0 0.5. Um, and secondly, most your UTP cable is copper clad. So it's not a good copper. It's a mixture of copper and aluminium and some other steels. I don't know the exact how they make it up, but that's why they call it a copper clad. So as soon as you start taking the copper out of um, a wire, that wire becomes less conductive, if you want to put it that way. So the worse your conductivity, the more power drop you're going to get over your, your 12 volts. So you might start off with 13.5 volts at your power supply, but by the time you get to your camera, you've only got 11 volts or 10 volts or whatever the case is. And then you start having issues with things like your IR is not switching on, your camera switching on and off, things like that. So if you then measure the power there with your IRs on, you, you see that your power is below 11 volts. Okay, so that's basically what happens when, you, when you're not using, um, when you don't have sufficient power at your camera side. Okay, so DC voltage gets lost if you want to say if you want to call that very quickly on long cable lengths. So 40 meters and longer. So if you're running 12 volts on 40 meters, you pr that's pretty much the maximum that we would even suggest, even with your um, 0 0.5 mil copper core cable. So 40 meters, not longer than that is probably a you, you're going to start getting power loss. Um, it is therefore recommended to install a power supply closer to the cameras. So closer than 40 meters um, is probably your ideal. Cameras use a lot more power when the infrareds are switched on. If your camera uh, starts acting strange or switching on and off at night but works fine during the day, it is, good to in, uh, it is a good indication that your power supply is not sufficient. Okay, so when we say power supply not sufficient, the power at the camera is being lost across your, your power cable somewhere along the line. Okay, guys, we almost finished. Um, I've got two more slides left. And then if you guys want to stay on, like I mentioned earlier, if you want to stay on, I'm going to do like a little practical um, example of adding uh, NVR and adding cameras to an NVR. If you guys are more than welcome, if you're happy with um, what's been discussed and et cetera, um, then you're welcome to jump off and carry on with your day. 
I know we said probably till about half past one, so we've got plenty of time left still for what was scheduled. Um, but like I say, if you want to stay on for a little longer, and I can we can run through, and you guys can give me some questions. Okay, so my sins asked the question: What is the difference between a DVR, NVR, and XVR? So DVR basically stands for a digital video recorder. So when people refer to a DVR, it basically encompasses anything that's a digital video recorder. So a digital video recorder is pretty much the definition there is um, that it's digitally collecting that information and storing it to a hard drive. So if somebody refers to a DVR correctly, um, like Christensen says, it can refer to to a DVR, it can refer to XVR, or can refer to NVR. So DVRs are generally, the old traditional thing was that the DVRs were the old analog, analog things, but the analog actually gets converted into a digital. So when somebody talks in general about a DVR, it's really just a, 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 a digital video recorder. So it's recording it to a hard drive or, or digitally taking your video and, and, and storing it. NVRs is a network video recorder. So network video recorder is obviously only for the networks. And the XVR is actually not sure, quite sure what the X stands for, but it's anyway, it's an X video recorder, which includes your analog, your HDCVR, your AHD, your TVRs. So XVR can recognize all those different formats. Um, and can also recognize IPs. So uh, uh, XVR is, the X I guess just X includes everything, it doesn't exclude any, everything if you want to put it that way. Um, so yeah, your XVRs, but DVR basically encompasses all of them as, as such. So your XVR is just the uh, indication that your XVR can do analog HTCVR, um, TVI, AHD, as well as RP cameras. So your XVR basically does all. NVR only does your network cameras because obviously you don't have plugs to plug in any analog or, or HTCVR cameras. So it's only NVR is only your network and then DVR, I would say, probably encompasses all of that. Okay, so that answers that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, my same thanks. XVR equals NVR plus DVR. Yeah, okay, so yeah, like, like I said, um, XVR can take both RP and analog and the different, the, all the different formats. That's why they basically refer to it as an XVR. Um, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so what is the NVR and DV? What is a DVR and NVR? Well, here we go. We go right into it. Um, so DVR is a digital video recorder, or a network video recorder is a NVR. Um, is the device or software that records video pictures digitally onto your hard drive. Yeah, which I originally said. <laughs> DVR and NVRs generally come in a full 816 or 32 channel, even up to uh, 68 and now RPs are even doing 128 channels, which is, whew, yeah, a lot to display onto a screen. This is the maximum amount of cameras, camera channels allowed on the DVR or NVR. Um, I suppose we should be saying XVR or NVR, but anyway, DVR. <laughs> on many DVRs, you can change the channel type from uh, BNC to RP. However, unless speci uh, specified, you can still only have a maximum amount of camera channels stipulated. So some of the XVRs that, that, that the Hua sell are actually 16 channels and they have what I call free RP channels. So what you can do is you have your 16 channels and then sometimes in your spec sheets will tell you you can have eight RP cameras additionally. So you can pretty much, uh, you can pretty much have 
uh, your, your 16 channels are analog, and then you can still add on um, eight channels of RP. So again, check the spec sheets because not all of them have that facility. Um, some of them will do 16 plus maybe two RPs, but you can replace all the channels with RP channels. So you can have, for example, let's say we've got a, a 16 channel XVR that allows extra additional eight uh, RPs. You can have 24 RP cameras on that DVR. Um, or you can have 16 HD CVR cameras and then additional eight, eight making it the full 24 channel. All right, so you can, with, with XVRs, you can chop and change and plan. Again, with XVRs, um, the difference between, the main difference between the XVR and the NVR, if you're using IP cameras, um, is the XVR has limited features when it comes to using or enabling the additional IP cameras. So your processing of, on your XVR is less than on your NVR. So if you're doing a full set of, uh, of, of NV, uh, a full set of IP cameras, so you want 16 IP cameras, rather go for an NVR because your processing power is better, your functionality of your NVR is better, and that's what it's actually designed for. So XVRs are, are, are more designed to switch between um, a, a, a traditional DVR or old um, analog DVR to HDCVR, incorporating you to be able to use um, HDCVR cameras as well as now integrating into RP and maybe at a later stage actually convert everything over to RP. So DVRs require hard drive, uh, hard drives to record the data and they will have a maximum number of hard drives supported. The more hard drive space, the more video recording you can store. So just a quick note there as far as when you're looking at the specs on uh, uh, XVR or NVR, um, so your, when, you, for example, you see XVR, um, let's say 5116, um, so the, the, the 5 indicates the series that it's, that it's what, so feature-wise, if you want to put it that way. So 5 indicates the series, 1, the first 1 will indicate your amount of hard drives, so if you've got a 5116, it has one hard drive capability of one hard drive. If you go 52, then that means it's got a capability of two hard drives. And then the 16 thereafter is the number of channels. And then there's a, usually a whole string of other uh, per, paraphernalia behind that, which obviously indicates the different types of features and the type of stuff that that uh, DVR or NVR will have. But Talking about hard drives specifically and the amount of hard drives that you can take on a device, quick ways to see by the product code. So 5.1 um, will be series 5 and one hard drive. A 5.2 will be five series with two hard drives. And then obviously indication of your channels either uh, 0, 4, 0, 8, uh, 16 or 32. So it'll be 5.2, 0, 4, for example, not that a four channel will have two hard drives, but anyway, five, two, one, six will be a uh, five series, two, two hard drives, 16 channel. Okay, just a simple way to, to quickly determine how many hard drives your, your DVRs or NVRs can actually take. Same thing with NVRs. Um, I suppose I should have just said DVRs, but NVRs is also the same thing. So NVR will it'll start off with NVR, uh, five, two, and then the channels. Um, so it'll be five series, two hard drives, 16 channel, or XVR 5216, which would be uh, XVR five series, two the hard drives, 16 channel. Okay. Okay, recordings on motion detect. The DVRs will only record video with when it detects uh, a change in the images. So as far as motion detect, if you have your camera set to motion detect, so you'll see on your configuration of your DVRs, you have um, a option to either do motion detect or continuous record. Um, if you set it to motion detect, only if there's motion will that, that um, device record. Just a note as far as setting up your DVRs with, with motion detect. So motion detect sounds like it's a good thing, so it should save you lots of hard drive space and et cetera, et cetera. The problem be 
is if you set motion detect on a very busy area, so let's say a shopping center where you've got people moving in and out all the time, um, especially during the day. So let's say you want, you, you've got yeah, people moving in during the day and you've got people moving in the whole time. If you set that, that camera to be motion detect, what the camera actually does is for each motion detect scenario that it actually starts and stops, it writes a header, then it rec records its footage, for its motion in other words, um, then it writes a footer. So if you can imagine if there's continuous movement happening on, on a, and you've set your camera to motion detect, for each one of those movements, so each segment of video that it's actually trying to record to the hard drive, it's got to write a footer and a header. Um, so what happens become those footers and headers, there might be 20 million footers and headers in a day. So that just increases your hard drive space because it needs to write that all the time. So the better way to do it is if a company is, if you've got a busy area that people are moving in all the time, uh, but at night there's no movement, um, the better way to do is do a continuous record during the day and then a motion detect at night where um, your continuous record will record anything that's happening. So it only writes one header and one footer for the day. Um, unlike if for each motion detect scenario, it writes a header, footer, header, footer, header, footer. So as you can see, that, that'll increase your, hard, your usage of your hard drive space and actually not be beneficial to you. So during the day, you set as, as continuous record and at night you can send, then set as motion detect because now there shouldn't actually be any, um, anything happening at night other than maybe a cat or a dog or something running around that, that'll set that, that motion detect. But, so at night you don't need, if there's no movement at night, you don't need to continuously record at night. Um, and so you, you can motion detect, that'll save your hard drive space. But your motion detect in a busy area during the day is not going to save your hard drive space. It's actually going to increase your hard drive usage. Okay, input triggers. So the, uh, the DVRs can perform certain actions upon an input trigger, i.e. record or trigger an output event. So talking about that is, let's take a scenario where you have, let's call it passive. You know, if you want to integrate your alarm system into the DVR system and you have a passive or a door, something that's opening a door or you have a safe that shouldn't be opened um, maybe during a specific period or something to that effect, you can connect this to a door magnet um, and then set your, your schedule period for this alarm to be active. So as soon as that thing gets opened, um, you will get a notification or it'll trigger the input on your, your DVR. Um, and that will then set off either an alarm to the camera or set, or I could even spin a PTZ to, to that area, or it could set off an alarm. So it could set off an output. So your input can, can be set to set off an output. So you could, for example, have your DVR input that, okay, this door has been opened and you can, on your output, you can have a siren running. And then the DVR will control that for you. And obviously, if there's a camera or whatever attached to that same input, that, that camera will start recording and doing whatever the case is. So that's how you could really use inputs and output triggers. Um, again, check your spec sheets. Make sure that your, your, your DVR has inputs and outputs. Um, a lot of the DVRs now, especially the AI, um, seem to have done away with the, the inputs and outputs. So just yeah, check your spec sheets, especially on the XVRs. NVRs will require it to happen on the camera. Um, your NVR, you generally don't have an input or an output. So that, that needs to be triggered from your camera side. So your, some of your cameras will have like a alarm input and alarm output, or it'll have mics or whatever that's, that's on the camera. So that's really what they're for and um, can be utilized in, in many different, different ways. Okay, so connecting remotely to your DVRs. Um, you can connect to the DVR remotely on the network 
or on the internet to view your camera images. You can do this, and uh, you can do this from the app or from your PC um, or a smartphone. Okay. Recording while viewing past events. You can view previously recorded video while still recording current video. So you can be doing your playback um, at the same time. Um, sorry, my apologies about that. Uh, so, so with digital video recorders, you can pretty much uh, do a playback and a video record both at the same time. So when you're doing a, a playback on your, your DVRs, it doesn't affect your live, um, your live stream and your recording of your, your live stream coming through um, at the time. Okay. Um, okay, so you also have functions um, which I'm sure a lot of you guys actually use is you can take snapshots uh, with your DVR so you can actually save pictures, which is a, a feature that needs to be enabled as default um, on the Dahua DVRs anyway. Um, as default, it is disabled, so, but you can save snapshots and pictures, especially if you're doing things like RVS and you want a snapshot um, of maybe a car driving past or whatever. So you can record that video and have snapshots. Um, and then you can just go through, if you're doing a video uh, a playback, then you can actually just go through and look at your pictures rather than looking at the video if you want to use it, use it in that way. You also have what they call video with um, video with watermarks. So the watermark basically just um, is a security feature that that can be taken to court. That allows the, the um, uh, let's say the judge or the police or uh, what's his name says he was involved in forensics. I'm sure he, he uses the authentication of the the watermark um, on a regular basis. So watermarking basically embeds a name or, or something that you've, you've set as your watermark and embeds that into your video so that they can confirm that that video has never been tampered with. So to prove the authentic authenticity of that, that video, um, it just is an extra cover um, for the customer to say, yes, this is actually the authentic video. It hasn't been tampered with at the end of the day. Um, just a note on that, if you are um, pulling it off onto a USB stick or whatever the case is, you need to pull it off in its original format. Um, you can't pull it off as a JPEG or MP3 or anything like that. It's got to be in the, the original format and you have to use the the the, 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 the specific software that is um, supplied with that, that footage. So when you're doing your recording, there's usually an option to say include player. So you need to include player and you need to include the player and then obviously put it into its, um, its original format that, that uh, DVR actually records in. So then, then only then will it actually bring the watermark across and be uh, proven to be authentic. Okay. Okay, so audio recordings. So a lot of the, the, the XVRs um, and NVRs actually um, have audio recordings. The audio recording um, can be done from the camera um, or, or can use a separate uh, coax uh, connection and attach its camera uh, and attach that camera to the DVR. So on the, on the DVR side of things, uh, you do have the audio in audio art ports, but you also now have what they call audio over coax. So your audio over coax works in the way that your, your 
your DVR needs to facilitate that audio over coax and so does your camera. So um, the idea there is that your camera has a mic on it, built in, generally. Um, then with your normal coax cable, it'll transmit your video and your audio via the coax cable and your DVR will then record that audio um, and, and video. So that's why they call it audio over coax. The next step to that as well is that they now have bringing out the audio uh, power over coax. So you can actually run your power, your audio, your video, and everything over one coax cable. Again, both the camera and the XVR needs to be compatible with, with those features. Um, Christian's still uh, asking, can you re uh, record um, audio without control room hearing it? Um, so when your remote connects um, to, to a device, your audio needs to be enabled. So your audio will be recorded, um, but if you want to listen to live audio, you actually got to click on the, the little mark at the top to make that live audio come through. So to answer that question, no, you can't because you're gonna, you, you've recorded it. So if you do a playback, you're still gonna get that audio. Um, and live view as well as a matter of just, if you, if you don't click the, the, the speaker at the top, then you won't hear the audio. But if you click the speaker on the top, um, yes, you'll hear the audio and there's no way to really disable that function. Um, I suppose you, you could disable it in your user rights where the, if, you, if you create a user, you can decide what that user can actually watch or see, which channels it's allowed to see, which um, rights it has to do whatever on that, on that DVR. So you could create a user, so don't give the, give the control room the um, administrator uh, user, create a new user, and from there you can limit what they can see, what they can't see, what they can hear, what they can't hear. In the That'll probably be a better way than just trying to, to not have the thing recorded. So limit them by user rather than um, limiting them by functionality. So the user will limit the functionality, put it that way. Um, Christian, if you, if you want, after the session, if you want me to go through and show you how, if you're not sure how to do that, um, I can go through after the session, happy to just show you, um, just, yeah, call me a little bit later and we can go through that if you want. Okay, advanced features. So some of the DVRs, NVRs has specifically features like facial recognition, point to sale, license plate recognition. Um, so the, those, those type of things are specialized, what we call specialized cameras. So, um, things like your facial recognition is becoming very, very popular. Your POS, which stands for point of sale. So, for example, let's take a, a shopping, let's take a spa or checkers or a pick and pay or whatever the case is. They've got cameras looking down over the tills and they basically, they can, from their tills, whatever the till transaction is, that till transaction can be overlaid onto your video footage that you're busy um, recording. Um, quite tricky to set up in most instances because your point of sale tills need to be compatible in one way or other to, to the DVR, other by the, the functions that they push out or et cetera, et cetera. So just because the DVR says that I can do POS doesn't mean to say that it's inter going to integrate into into that, that specific tool. So be very cautious as far as what you can and can't do as far as those are concerned. Um, so yeah, but point of sale is basically overlaying that transaction. So every time that a scan gets done, for example, that transaction, say you're buying six bottles of milk, that shows milk, 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 six times and the price basically will overlay onto your video. When you do a playback, you can then um, see it. If it's true POS, you can actually go and search 
for that text. So you can say, show me all video footages for milk. And then it'll actually bring up all the video footages for milk and then you can go through and have a look for those videos. So it's, it's quite cool. It gets quite, quite complex and, and integrated. So Um, so questions, the, the poppy, so again, you know, you obviously need to get um, authorization from your, your customers as to what you, you are monitoring or what you're allowed to see. Um, again, locking it down to locking the user that you're using to connect to those, those customers is probably your best bet as far as um, saying, so sit down with your customer and say, um, Mr. Customer, what would you like us to, to monitor? If it says everything, then obviously you can just monitor everything. If it says, no, I don't want you to see camera number five, and I want you to see camera number six, because that's more in my private area or in my office, I don't need you to see what I'm doing all day. Then you can actually, when you're setting up your user, you can exclude those cameras. So if, if somebody logs in with those, that user information, they will only see what you've, you've set up on that DVR for, um, for what they're allowed to see or what they're allowed to do on that, on that DVR. So generally, I wouldn't suggest that you just go ahead and add that DVR to your, your uh, DSS or add it as an administrator because as soon as you do that, then you have full rights of the system to do whatever you want to as far as settings as far as recording playbacks as far as enabling stuff and disabling stuff and then also you don't know who's actually logged into that that dvr because all it's going to show you at the end of the day in the logs is admin so who's admin was it the customer was it you who was it at the end of the day that actually logged into that dvr and and um changed the settings for example let's say so Yes, I always recommend that you take it and you say, set up a user specifically to allow that user to only do specific functions and then bring that into your monitoring control rooms or whatever the case is. And use that user, don't, don't add it into your control room as admin because that just causes a whole lot of issues for yourself and for the customer. And it's, there's no real way to monitor and say, well, okay, Johnny did it, or, or the, the customer logged in as admin and did it, or whatever the case is. So your logs won't show that. Okay. Um, so getting back to your, your advanced features. Um, so you, you nowadays get, get your license plate recognition cameras that are designed specifically for license, rec uh, license plate recognition. So these license plate recognition cameras can for example, automatically open booms for you. They can detect your speed. They can have what they call um, a blacklist or a whitelist. So if, for example, a blacklisted vehicle comes through, um, it will then notify and set off alarms and do whatever it needs, needs to do to notify the, the people that there's a blacklist uh, vehicle that has now entered or exited or driven past or whatever the case is or you get a whitelisted vehicle that drives up to a boom, automatically opens that boom without any tags or anything like that. Yes, I know it's on everybody's mind, what happens if it's a false number plate? Unfortunately, it's going to open the boom. It doesn't know whether that number plate is false or not. However, with the new AR um, license plate recognition cameras, they're getting very clever. So. Um, although it hasn't really been tested yet, this is like a seriously new feature that we've only been told about most recently. So you can actually say the number plate is attached to a color or a make of a vehicle. So if a black car drives in with a, with a number plate that is supposed to be a white car, then it won't open the gate. Or if, uh, um, if a Toyota drives in and is supposed to be a Mercedes, then it's not going to open the gate either because it's going to look at the logo and it's going to look at the, the color of the vehicle. So with the new AR ones, they're getting clever like that. And actually, again, AR being your learning algorithm the whole time, it's going to get better and better and better. And the, the, 
the learning process of color and manufacturer and all that type of stuff will then be built in as a security feature for recognizing those number plates. Sure. Hold on a sec, I need a drink of my coffee, guys. Give me two seconds. <laughs> I'm sure we've been through that already. Uh, okay, so we we jumped the gun a bit earlier discussing the, the DVR and NVR. Um, I, I think we pretty much got the gist of it. I'm sure we don't need to go through, through the slide. I think I pretty much discussed the differences between a DV, uh, XVR and the NVR or a, uh, yeah, the differences between XVR and, should actually say XVR and NVR rather than DVR. Um, so the main differences again are just, as you can see in the pictures there, your, uh, let me get my pointer up. So as you can see here, your, your XVRs or DVRs as such, um, they obviously need uh, the BNC connectors, whereas your LAN uh, and your, your network or NVR has either POEs or, and a LAN, or it has no POEs and just by LAN. Okay, so you also get the NVRs that, that do, um, for example, is a 16 channel, but it only has eight POEs. So like this one, for example, is probably a 16 channel, so your eight POEs can be used to, to drive your, your one set of eight cameras and then your LAN port with a switch needs to be used to drive your other eight cameras to be, to be able to obviously get your 16, 16 channels. Okay. And so this, this, this NVR in the picture here um, shows that it's got inputs and, and outputs. Um, a lot of the new NVRs don't, they rely on the camera to do those inputs and outputs. Um, I'm just looking at the one that I have actually here, it definitely doesn't have any of those inputs and outputs. So this is quite an old, old NVR I take, I take and yeah, a lot of the NVRs don't have these, these inputs and output ports. Um, all, all the DAWA, the whole equipment, XVRs and, and NVRs side of things, both all have HDMI and VGA ports that you can use. And that is dual shared screen. So whatever's on the VGA also displays on the HD, HDMI. Um, you do get the DVRs and N, I mean XVRs and NVRs that can do what they call video spot. So you can split your video between your VGA and HDMI. So you can have HDMI showing one thing and VGA showing the other thing. But most of the DVRs and NVRs that, that come out only uh, uh, have a shared, shared video chip. So your v VGA and HDMI are actually one, one video chip and one screen. Then to go a little bit further to the higher end NVRs, <clears throat> you actually have the high NVRs, which is a VGA, and two HDMIs. Um, so you can actually have a shared VGA um, and HDMI screen, and you can have a secondary HDMI, which can display something totally different. Mm -hmm. So again, check your spec sheets, check what, what, what facility, what, what the, the NVRs facilitate, and we can obviously advise you further, your, your sales guys can obviously advise you I'll pause you further to what you're um, looking at or needing. So Eric, um, Alric, sorry, Alric. Alric, yes, um, Alric is awesome. Can HDMI and VGA be used at the same time? Most definitely, you can plug in a VGA and a HDR monitor and they will display exactly the same. Um, just a note there, make sure that your monitors can display the resolution because it is a shared chip, you can only set the resolution um, once you don't have a resolution for HDMI and VGA, unless you can split, uh, unless the, the NVR, DVR, uh, XVR has a um, dual chip where you can do um, spot outs and that type of stuff, then you can set your resolution. 
but your, your VGA and your HDMI generally need to be, um, be able to handle the same resolution as what you're pushing out of your DVR. So that pretty much brings me to the end of the, the, the presentation. Thanks for the rest of you. Have a good day. Cheers.